Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Big Data. So I've referred to Big Data previously in the last video. Uh, and the basic idea behind Big Data is we can use processing power to extract useful information from massive amounts of data. And as the cost of storing information is decreasing, we're able to collect more and more data. As our processing power is increasing, we're able to more easily process it. And it, it turns out that new techniques in artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning are giving us new ways to process large amounts of data. And so big data is referring to this ability to process the large amounts of data that we didn't have previously. Those that study big data sometimes refer to the three V's of big data. The first V is the volume of information. How much information do we have? The second V is velocity. How quickly is that data arriving? If uh, the data is not arriving that quickly, we can often process it in real time as it's streaming in. However, if there's too much information for us to handle, we're going to need large storage uh, facilities in order to store that information and then batch process the information uh, at some later point in time. The third V is variety. How many different types of data are we dealing with? Um, in general, we can divide the data into two types. Structured data, which is data that is easy for the computer to process. So something like a table of information, like say um, a pass list of passenger manifests that's super easy for the computer to deal with. It's already in a format that the computer understands. In contrast, unstructured data is much harder for the computer to uh, process. And this might be something like a video. So suppose we have a video of people arriving and departing from a passenger terminal that obviously is going to take a lot of work in order for us to process it and get some useful information out of it. Some researchers have added a fourth V to the previous three Vs, and that is the veracity of the data. And I think, unfortunately, in our current environment, this makes a lot of sense. So how accurate is the information we're working with and how sure are we of the data sources? So I think particularly with things like deep fakes, and uh, poor actors like Russian bot accounts, say on Twitter, um, it becomes increasingly important for us to think about where our data sources are and um, what those data sources can tell us. Now, you know, obviously, if you've got something like uh, a Russian bot account, actually studying the Russian bot accounts themselves with big data techniques can also give you some information. But you do need to, uh, you know, carefully think about what your sources of data are and what they mean. Uh, one thing that big data can be used for is removing anonymity on data that is thought to be anonymous. So uh, in one example, Netflix released a set of data with the names removed and allowed different data researchers to work with that data and uh, learn from it. And it turns out that uh, a group from the University of Texas, Austin, was able to remove the anonymity of the data. Um, what they did was they compared the data that Netflix had provided uh, with things like what different um, people watching Netflix had watched. And uh, back then, we used to be able to give movies number of stars instead of just thumbs up and thumbs down on Netflix. And what they did was they compared the ratings provided in the anonymous data with ratings provided at IMDB by various users. And uh, even if somebody only had a few ratings out at IMDb, they were able to match up IMDb accounts with Netflix accounts. And on that basis, they were able to uh, figure out what different users at an IMDb had actually watched on Netflix, even though uh, the IMDb users had not intended to release their viewing habits out on Netflix. Um, uh, one famous use of big data is the target stores pregnancy detection uh, story. So this is coming from an article in the New York Times, and uh, I've included a link to this article in your class notes. So the background on this story is typically, uh, and this, this uh, background is from some research out at UCLA, typically customers form habits and shop at the same stores for mundane items. So if you're buying, you know, we all have to buy soap, toothpaste, trash bags, and other items on a fairly regular basis. And 
typically we're just going to buy them at the exact same stores all the time over and over and over again. But those buying habits can change during major life events, such as when we get married or when we buy a new house or something like that. And it turns out one of the big events is, of course, having children. So uh, when somebody is having a child, uh, that's a big opportunity for stores to step in and try and change uh, buying habits of, of different people. And in addition, another nice thing about uh, pregnancy from the store's point of view is new and expecting parents can be expected to buy lots of stuff. I can also point out that the same thing is true of uh, people buying a house. You buy a new house and suddenly your expenses go up for a while because you realize you've got all this stuff that you need for the house that you never thought of before. Um, now, as far as pregnancy goes um, and childbirth goes, there are official public birth records, but everybody has access to them. And so uh, if you wait for the public birth records to come out, you're going to be bombarding these parents with advertisements at the exact same time as everybody else is going to bombard them with information. And so um, Target wanted a way to get a jump up on their competitors and discover when people were pregnant before their competitors were able to from the public birth records. Now, in order to do this, Target actually had a, a bunch of key data sets that really helped them out. The first thing is they had information on their the purchasing habits on some of their customers. Um, if you have a discount card for uh, a different store, those discount cards are used to track your information. So the bargain is you're going to get a discount on purchases, but in return, the store is going to be able to identify your particular purchase patterns. Um, in addition, they have other information. For example, they may have your age, your marital status, the number of kids you have. Um, in the case of Target, they knew how far you live from it, the closest Target store and had an estimate of salary. So that was one data set Target had. And then the second data set that Target had was people who had registered for the Target uh, baby shower registry. So they had one set of information on uh, the buying habits, and they were able to identify specifically when some of those people uh, were pregnant um, and have some idea on the timing there. And so what they did was they took all the information and used big data techniques. They were able to discover that pregnant women purchased large quantities of unscented lotions at the beginning of the second trimester. They purchased supplements of calcium, magnesium, and zinc uh, for the first 20 weeks, and they purchased scent-free soap and extra large bags of cotton balls. In total, Target was able to identify 25 different items that acted as pregnancy indicators. They also learned some lessons about advertising. Uh, basically, they learned that if you send people advertisements filled with baby items, they find that kind of creepy. And so they decided they were better off mixing, uh, mixing advertisements. So quoting from the article, um, they were basically mixing in all these ads for things that we knew pregnant women would never buy so that the baby ads looked random. We'd put an ad for a lawnmower next to diapers. As long as the pregnant woman thinks she hasn't been spied on, she'll use the coupons. There's a, another amusing anecdote from the story. Um, a man walked into Target outside of Minneapolis and demanded to see the manager. He was clutching coupons that had been sent to his daughter, and he was angry, according to an employee who participated in the conversation. My daughter got this in the mail, he said. She's still in high school, and you're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? The manager didn't have any idea what the man was talking about. He looked at the mailer, and sure enough, it was addressed to the man's daughter and contained advertisements for maternity clothing, nursery furniture, and pictures of smiling infants. The manager apologized and then called a few days later to apologize again. On the phone, though, the father was somewhat abashed. I had a talk with my daughter, he said. It turns out there have been some activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. She's due in August. I owe you an apology. All right, so another fine story about what computing can do. Um, I'll talk to you all again soon.